I'm a guard at a graveyard. Part 2. Written by Via Creepy. I know it hasn't been that long yet, but a lot has happened in the last few days. I've talked more with the police, but the only leads they have at the moment are me and the theory of a random grave robbery gone wrong. I don't think I can rely on the police to figure this all out. They're approaching it completely wrong. I think I found out who the young ghost could have been. The last member of the Vervelot family who had been laid to rest in that crypt had been Fridolin Verlot. She was laid to rest on October 14, 1902. She was an only child and died unmarried and childless at the age of 43, effectively ending the Vervelot family. Her father had died at the age of 64, and while some ghosts like to appear younger, most will choose the appearance from when they died. Emotional reasons, I presume. He, however, used to have a brother, Fredoline's uncle. He had died at the age of 23 because of complications with pneumonia back in November 1854. His name had been Julien Vervelot. I'll never know for sure if it had been him, though, unless he appears to speak with me again, which I'm not sure he will. I found his name while digging through the old burial records at my parents' house. They keep those alongside lots of books, newspapers, and maps down in their private basement library. I broke in through the back door. Yes, broke in. I don't have a key anymore, and they wouldn't let me have a look through their precious items if I had asked kindly. We aren't on the best of terms, to say the least. The last time I had been down there, I had been 15 years old, and the door had been locked from the outside. My father had told me again and again to learn the names and maps and dates, and I tried. I genuinely did. But no matter how hard I tried, the details would always slip my mind the moment someone actually asked me about them. I knew who might have saved my life, but not who had tried to take it, or why. I wish I could say that I've made progress when it comes to that topic, but I haven't. Not at all. I've got enemies, lots of them. I'm not a particularly social person. My family isn't well liked, and I've pissed off a lot of people during my school years. But I highly doubt that I've pissed off anyone this badly. I've been checking the locks on my windows day and night. I haven't slept since the incident, but instead have been sitting on the ground in front of my door, a knife lying next to me. Nothing has really happened, but I don't think that it's going to stay that way for long. It feels like someone is watching me, just waiting for the right moment. I hadn't even noticed half the day had already passed when my phone's ringtone startled me so badly that I almost jumped up to my feet. Incoming call by unknown number. My phone's display provided helpfully and for a moment I contemplated not picking it up just to shut my phone off and hide in bed or something like that. Then I remembered. I grew up with parents who scared me more than any ghost ever had. I wouldn't let this drive me crazy. Slowly, I picked up the phone and held it up against my ear. Hello? Sasha, are you alright? I just came back and saw the news. Man, do you need anything? My friend's voice washed over me and I sank back into a laying position, staring up at the ceiling. My thoughts were going a thousand miles a second and so was my heart. Mathis, you, uh, 
got a new number. I wasn't sure how to answer his actual question yet, so instead I went for the most obvious way to avoid it altogether. My friend seemed to shuffle around at the other end, probably getting comfortable on his couch. Very quietly, I could hear his cat in the background. I smiled a little. Not exactly, I am, but don't laugh. I kind of let my phone fall into a bathtub. While, well, you know, while it was filled with water. Anyways... It's in a bucket of rice now for the next few days, and so I managed to convince my brother to lend me his old phone for the time being. So, if you need anything, you can reach me under this number until my phone is alive again. If, positive thinking, my phone will get through this. I nodded, not replying for a moment, trying to calm my heart. It was good to hear a familiar voice, even though Mathis and I weren't the closest of friends lately. There had been this whole unnecessary drunken fight between him and me a few weeks ago and, well, that's a story for another time. Listen, if you don't want to talk right now or something, that's fine. I get it. Just send me a text later or whatever and... We're good. He continued after I hadn't answered at all and I blinked, noticing that I had spaced out. Uh, No, no, it's fine. I'm just tired, I guess. I tried to laugh a little, play it off as a joke. But the moment the corners of my lips lifted, there was a knock on my door. I was on my feet in an instant, staring at the door. Mathis was still talking, but I had lowered the phone so far that I couldn't make out the words anymore. The sound of his voice blended together with the blood pounding in my ears. Inching closer towards the door, I carefully raised a hand to place it onto the doorknob, keeping it tightly shut without a noise. I then leaned forward and peeked through the spy hole in the door. The corridor outside was dimly lit by the one window several feet down to the left. I could make out the door of my neighbor right across from me and wrapping around it was an empty corridor. No one was there. I took a deep breath, then raised the phone back to my ear. I'll call you back, I mumbled before ending the call, not even waiting for Mathis to reply. I waited. For several minutes, nothing happened. Maybe I had just imagined the knock. Often people hear or see things if they're stressed. And I was a depressed university student working night shifts who had just lost his colleague to a violent crime. There was, possibly still is, a high probability that I'm just imagining things that aren't actually there. When no further knocking occurred, no one tried to move the doorknob and no one walked past. I let out a deep breath and decided to open the door. In hindsight, yes, that was stupid. If someone wanted me dead, they might have been waiting at the end of the corridor and shot me the moment I stepped outside. But thankfully, they weren't. There was no one outside. Just a package. It was wrapped in gift paper. It was pink with green ribbons attached on top, and it was about as long as the lower part of my arm and as thick as a water bottle, if that helps you visualize it. I was quite perplexed, to say the least. I think I was staring at the package for quite a while, but I couldn't say for sure exactly the time frame. Again, my phone woke me from my stupor, and I jumped smacking my elbow into the doorframe in the process. The display again showed incoming call by unknown number, 
and I was still occupied with staring at the package while flexing my sore arm when I accepted the call. Holding the phone up to my ear, I hissed. I said I'd call you back, Mathis. I wanted to cancel the call right after saying that, but something felt off. There was this noise, almost like breathing, whistling breathing, nothing else. Mathis, I tried again, my voice shaking this time, and I tore my gaze away from the package, looking up and down the corridor, but no one was there. No reply came from the other end, just more breathing, and then the call suddenly cut off. My hands were shaking so badly I almost let go of the phone when I tried calling them back. It didn't work. Neither did Mathis's number. I'm not a tech guy. I'm not a phone guy. I got my first phone when I was 16 and left home. I don't actually know how to call an unknown number back. So instead, I dialed the number of Mathis's brother. He didn't pick up the first time, but at this point, I was well into a panic attack, so I tried again. When he finally picked up, I didn't even give him time to properly react before I was already talking. Are you with Mathis now? Uh, did he just call me? I, I can't call him back. His number is private or something. I, I don't know how these things work. I think I rambled a lot more about the same topics. But that was the general gist of the stuff I said. There was a moment of silence on the other end, and I could hear Philip moving around in what I presumed to be their flat. No, he's in the shower. His phone is on the table here. At this point, I threw the door shut and sat down on the ground against it, running a hand through my hair. I told him what had happened in as few words as possible. I could hear him agreeing with me from the other end of the line. Do you want me to come over? You call the police and I'll come over? Or you can stay over at our place if that would make you feel less stalked. I agreed and as if he could hear my thoughts focusing back onto the present right in front of my door, Philip added, And don't open the present. Let the police do that part. Got it? Got it. I mumbled before saying goodbye and hanging up. I talked to the police. I told them what had happened and they were up at my flat in less than 10 minutes. They actually cleared the building before picking up the present, fearing that it might be a bomb or something related, considering that I was involved in a murder case. Philip arrived at the station about an hour later to pick me up, but before we left, they told me what was in the package. Grave Earth, they said, together with a note which read, Where is the Chaston family buried? I don't remember there being a Chaston family on the graveyard's grounds, and I have walked those grounds over and over again. I could be wrong, but I don't think that I have seen a family grave with that name.